with us last night, you saw the piece where Kara is um, waterboarding Leoben, and I won't go into that because it's a part of our paper. But let me just say something about Kara's calling, because Kara's calling comes out of a profoundly different thing. It comes out of these dreams and visions that she begins to have about maelstroms and the drawings that she's doing. And so in one of the last episodes of one of the seasons before this past one, she ends up driving herself into a maelstrom, and she comes back and is reborn in a certain sense. And you're not quite sure who she is. But Leoben, who plays a very big role in her life, continues to say to her, you have a calling, you have a special destiny. But that calling becomes a little bit murky because the calling may also mean that she may also be the person who brings on the destruction of the human race. Now, what becomes very interesting about these two women in the midst of this is that for Laura, Laura's role as this sort of matriarch of the fleet ends up making her calling, making her a little bit more Madonna-like. In other words, she doesn't get to have sexuality. But Kara's sexuality is put out in front of the screen in front of you all the time because she's punching guys, she's sleeping with other people who aren't her husband, and even though she looks very boyish, there are many men that want her. And in the midst of this, you have this juxtaposition of two women, Madonna and a sort of a whore, but I wouldn't call her that having a calling and what does that mean and how do they work out that calling and how do the fans work out that calling but i'll get to that in a minute let me talk very briefly about saving grace saving grace is a little bit different because grace hannah darko like kara thrace has psychic scars that help explain her unruly persona during her prepubescent years she was raped repeatedly by a catholic priest that she called father patrick satan murphy as a young woman, she was victimized again when a one-night stand went bad and she was slashed. Her own pain and lack of resolution in her life drives Grace to meet out justice as an Oklahoma City detective. Her personal life and her career play out against the backdrop of losing a sister in the 1995 bar bombing of the Alfred P. Murrow building. Grace's only real familial collection is with her young nephew, Clay, whose mother was a family member that was killed in the bombing. Now, life for Grace, as she knows it, ends when, after a hard night of drinking, she drives her horse into a pedestrian. Trying desperately to revive him, Grace whispers, dear God, help me. When a scruffy older man appears and announces God has sent him to help, Grace assumes she's crazy. But when he unfurls a great set of white wings to prove that he, Earl, is indeed an angel, Grace fears that it is she who has come undone. In this initial response and in subsequent encounters, Grace makes it known that Earl's appearance is anything else but the enunciation of the traditional good, Christian good news. Rather, it is the beginning of ongoing resistance as Grace, like many before her, rebels against the call. That first night, when Grace questions whether Earl is really the real deal, she finds herself transported to the Grand Canyon. There, Earl tells her that she is going to hell unless she turns her life over to God. When Grace refuses to admit she needs divine help, Earl turns up, stirs up a tremendous storm. Fearing for her life, she takes his hand and he wraps her in his wings. There she feels the power of faith, which by her face looks like a lot of great sex. And Earl explains that he, like FedEx, is just delivering a message. So thus begins Grace's narrative arc of resistance and discovery. Throughout the first season, Grace doubles, struggles over what she must give up in order to turn her life over to God. Sleeping with her partner, lying to her friends, taking the Lord's name in vain, drinking a lot, all of Grace's bad behaviors are up for scrutiny, but Earl is not a deus ex machina, and Grace's path to salvation is anything else but conventional. Soon after Earl appears, Grace asks Retta, a forensic specialist, to help her decipher clues to Earl's identity and purpose. Retta, the believer to Grace's skeptic, accept the accepts the reality of signs, mysteries, and miracles. She also represents the Catholic world to which Grace, despite her estrangement, still belongs. And in a scene in the pilot, they debate the evidence of Earl through some different kinds of things. And she says, look, I know you go to Mass every Sunday and believe this is Grace, but I don't. And even St. Johnny said it didn't happen. Retta, he didn't know about the blood on your shirt. Grace, did you test it? Retta, it's not yours. Grace, is it human blood? Retta, as opposed to divine? Grace, I don't know. Retta, yes, it was human blood. Grace, you gotta test the dust, right? The dust that is from the Grand Canyon. Retta, why can't you just believe that it happened? Miracles happen all the time, you just have to believe. Grace, if there was a God, why would he save my ass last night? Retta, but not in fourth grade from Father Satan Patrick Murray Murphy. For Retta, Earl's existence opens up a realm of questions that she longs to ask. What about the virgin birth, the trinity of heaven? Retta believes in mysteries, but Grace doesn't really want to answer those questions at all. She's just trying to figure out how she can work this thing with, with um, Earl. 
and that becomes a problem. So Grace and Retta sort of do this little, little dance back and forth about Earl throughout the season. And throughout the season, what you see is Earl having these sort of confrontations, but it's also religiously ambiguous about this calling and how she works it out. But the calling is always worked out within the midst of this event that has happened. There are certain things throughout the season that, that sort of prick Grace and continue to go back to the original events. And the first season ends with a very um, poignant event of her sticking the gun into the face of the person who has molested her when she's a child. And I'll tell you what happened. But you'll have to read the essay for that. Let me close by talking just a little bit about how fans see this in, in closing. Fans light up to these women in part because they believe that their pain, the calling, all of these things, I quote, the pain for her, I feel for her, makes me want to pull her into my arms. The viewers make of these whores and Madonna's all sort of different things. Kara and Laura are beloved, Retta is like, Grace evokes passionate discord. Viewers either love or loathe her. Those in the latter category hate her skanky hair, potty mouth, and bony body. Initially, the TNT forum was flooded with Christians offended by the show's depiction of drinking, smoking, nudity, and adultery. Grace partners Ham as Mary. But others Chris criticized the Christian response as strikingly unchristian. In a defense of the series on GodTube, Charles R. C. wrote, Christians attacking the show missed the point. The show is for people who need it. If she were perfect, she wouldn't need God's help. The Pharisees complained that Jesus ate with sinners. Exactly. That was the whole point. Other viewers that talk about um, Grace, and here I will go ahead and quote what our real title of our thing is. One of the readers who wrote, uh, wrote in was a female comp and said had, she had special empathy for Grace. We cuss, we drink, we make stupid, risky sexual decisions. We find it impossible to commit because we find it impossible to trust. We doubt God is actually up there, but so would you if you saw what we see. In closing the post notes, a vagina ain't a halo a sentiment subversive of religious gender norms and shared by viewers who decry a double standard that condemned grace for behaviors that would be acceptable for men. And you can see some of the same pattern in stories about Kara Thrace and Laura Roslin as well, except for Laura Roslin, many of the Battlestar Galactica posts give her a romance with Adama. So what does all this mean, really? Let me just close very quickly. One thing that I think for Diane uh, Winston and I in this paper was to see how does calling work with women who are not just the avatars of, of beauty or also not just the avatars of beauty, but the avatars of what a perfect called woman would be. These women have flaws. They are ready to torture people. They are ready to sleep with people who are not their husbands, but they can still hear from divine calling. They know what a divine calling is. And what does it mean if, as the monster.com thing says, your calling is calling? How does that calling work out in the realm of television? And I think what these four female characters show us, and especially through Kara Thrace and um, Grace Hannah Darko, is that calling is not just limited to those who are the pure in heart, and sometimes the impure are called as well. Thank you. with the air conditioning and I'm going to talk very loudly and possibly overcompensate so I'm sorry if you're in the front row and I'm going to blow you away. Um, <clears throat> with the exception of overtly religious programs like Touched by an Angel or Joan of Arcadia, television is widely misperceived to be secular. Yet television experiences a religious awakening the moment an unwanted pregnancy enters the picture. A pregnant woman contemplating abortion prays, talks to her pastor, or at the very least, debates the meaning of life with friends. This now standardized formula owes a great deal to the religious right, which in staging its opposition to legalized abortion in the United States, has fashioned a one-size-fits-all narrative to explain how women confront the possibility of terminating a pregnancy. All unmarried sex leads to pregnancy, birth control rarely works, abortion is always a traumatic experience with dark moral implications, having a baby is inevitably beautiful and fulfilling. It wasn't until 30 years after Maud's 1972 abortion that a primetime character on network television would again choose to have an abortion. In effect, anxiety about protests from religious groups, Catholics and especially Christian fundamentalists, led to a narrative blackout. To analyze how American television has represented abortion and religion, this paper will